Uh, we're very excited about our guest speaker today, and I just want to let everybody know that the Zoom session uh, is being recorded. Uh, so we'll record the lecture uh, up until the question period, and then we'll end the recording there. Uh, and afterwards, the recording will be made available on the SFU Geography Zoom, uh, YouTube site. Uh, so you can look for it there. Uh, I also want to acknowledge that uh, we are hosting this talk, the Zoom portion of the talk, at least on the unceded traditional territories of the Coast Salish people, including the Tsleil-Waututh, Coquitlam, Squamish, and Musqueam nations, on which SFU Burnaby is located. Uh, and we were recognized that people are tuning in from all sorts of other uh, locations as well. Uh, so, as I said, welcome here. We're really excited that uh, everyone is joining us today. Uh, and we'll get to introducing our speaker in just a moment. But before we do, I want to just mention that upcoming, we have our final speaker event of the semester coming up on November 24th. Uh, and that's our travel logs event where we have uh, PhD student Megan Dinney. Uh, we have our own graduate uh, assistant, Curtis Platson and uh, a professor in geography, Peter Keller, who will be coming to tell uh, some stories from the field. So we're excited about that. Travel Logs is a much more sort of informal uh, setting uh, where we get to hear some of the lighter side of what goes on in geography uh, and in field data collection. So we're excited about that and we would invite you to join us. Uh, that will be an in-person event on SFP Burnaby's campus on November 24th. Uh, and information about that will be coming out uh, soon. Uh, but without further ado, uh, I'm going to ask Jesse Hahn, who is one of our uh, faculty members here in geography uh, in hydrology, to introduce our speaker today. So thanks, Jesse. Thank you, Andrew, for organizing. Our speaker today, Shway, is an assistant professor in the Department of Civil, Environmental, and Geoengineering at the University of Minnesota in Minneapolis. I had the pleasure of getting to know Shui when she was the Climate and Global Change Postdoctoral Fellow at the University of California, Berkeley, a role that she took on after she received her PhD in 2015 from Duke and her BS in 2010 from Stanford. Shui seeks to understand how ecosystems respond to water availability in the context of climate change. And I would say that she brings a mathematical rigor to the description of fundamental hydrologic processes. Among her many impactful contributions, Shui has advanced our understanding of water dynamics and seasonally dry ecosystems, just like our local climate here in BC. So I'm very excited today to hear about her recent work that considers ecohydrology in an important but understudied context, urban landscapes. So thank you, Shui, for taking the time to visit us virtually, and we look forward to your talk. All right. Thank you so much for that really nice introduction, Jesse. <laughs> Um, uh, I'm so honored to be invited to, to give the seminar here. Um, and like Jesse mentioned, my my training has been traditionally from a kind of a uh, natural watershed um, uh, perspective. And uh, what I'll be talking about is actually quite new work that we're doing in um, in around the Twin Cities area in Minneapolis and St. Paul, funded by the um, National Science Foundation long-term ecological research network and, and also from the Stormwater Research Council in Minnesota. So um, I'll just start by highlighting some of the distinguishing features of urban watershed when they're compared to more natural watershed. This is where my you know, hydrological intuitions have developed. And the picture on the top um, really shows watershed in a more natural setting. This is a fair, fairly famous uh, paired catchment study in the Hubbardbrook Experimental Forest that looks at the effect of deforestation um, and, and kind of establishing how water balance and stream flow would change after the lung cover was modified. But compared to these natural catchments, um, you can see on the bottom picture here that the urban watersheds show a much higher level of spatial heterogeneity and that's made possible by this kind of patchwork of impervious services um, and land covers that are subject to different degrees of management. So the relative abundance of impervious services here are contributing to a shorter travel time when water does transit through the watershed due to these preferential pathways created by roads, buildings, 
um, concrete reinforced channels, underground stormwater infrastructure, and this spatial heterogeneity complicates our understanding of the hydrological response. Um, and also because of its relatively recent history, data scarcity is still very much a pervasive problem in urban areas. We don't have synthesized, in, we haven't synthesized enough data which are often collected by cities and stormwater managers to, to truly get a holistic understanding of their hydrological response at the watershed scale. And to help mitigate some of these more extreme impacts of urbanization, um, stormwater managers often resort to these so-called nature-based solutions that try to restore urban watershed function back to what it was um, in a more natural state. And when it comes to the role of vegetation, we can actually borrow a lot of what we understand about vegetation physiology and function from natural environments and apply them in urban watersheds. And so, for example, when we take a tree, we know that they intercept water when it comes down as rainfall. Um, it kind of helps funnel them into stem flow, enhance infiltration. Um, and these type of functions and in urban contexts are often evaluated um, in, in the service of some desired outcome. So that when trees, canopies intercept rainwater, they also serve to reduce the volume and rate of runoff um, that can cause flooding and erosion and um, carry pollutant downstream. And in fact, a lot of the names that we adopt for urban nature, um, like the green infrastructure or nature-based solutions or stormwater control measures, best management practices, BMPs, or low impact developments, these kind of suggest a purpose and a management target. Um, and what they, they can actually also look like a, a range of, um, of forms, right? In addition to urban canopies, you also have green roofs, rain gardens, bioswells that are kind of built there to serve some kind of a purpose. And if we take a closer look at what those targets of um, urban nature or, or, or green infrastructure or vegetation is, um, we can kind of first start by talking about stormwater interception. Here I'm showing a study in northern Wisconsin, actually close to where we are in Minnesota, that leveraged the planned removal of ash and maple trees in a paired basin study. Um, this is this type of paired basin study are similar to the ones that hydrologists like to do in forested watershed. Um, and what they wanted to see is to examine how much stormwater volumes would have increased when the trees were removed in the test basin compared to the control basin. And what they found is that when you remove street tree canopies, um, the stormwater runoff compared to a control basin increased by 4%. And in a follow-up study, they estimated this to translate to about 10,000 liters of stormwater per tree per year that was intercepted by the canopy. And so this is kind of consistent with the range of values that have been found in previous studies. So we know that trees serve to reduce the, the overall amount of run, runoff in, in, um, in urban systems. Uh, we also know that they can change um, the surface energy budget and, and lead to cooling effects. So they change the surface energy budget through shading, but also by diverting more of the solar energy directed toward latent heat flux, or which is used to transpire water through trees. Um, they divert the energy from latent heat flux, oh, actually from sensible heat flux to latent heat flux. And so they, the, the, the sensible heat flux component is associated with surface increase, which means that the function of trees and taking up water actually take up more energy from the sun such that it is then diverted from increasing surface temperature. So um, what this means is that you can see in this thermal image taken during a heat wave in Melbourne, Australia, that in areas that are close to trees, you see more of a cooling effect compared to the area surrounding them that are covered by pavements. 
Um, on the left-hand side, I'm showing another study that was conducted in Phoenix, Arizona, that analyzed spatial patterns of biophysical and social economic variables like um, satellite-derived surface temperature, um, increasing from black to white, um, the soil-adjusted vegetation index, um, and then a census track um, that sh that's showing um, median household income. So what the study have done is to kind of conduct a path analysis showing the determinants of neighborhood level surface temperature, which is shown here as a variable. And these partial regression coefficients are included for each uh, link that has a significant interaction with those variables. And, um, and the ones that I will highlight is just a positive correlation between mean vegetation cover or sorry, negative correlation between mean vegetation cover and mean surface temperature and a positive correlation between median income and mean vegetation cover. And so um, this is saying that in neighborhoods, in, in kind of richer neighborhoods with higher income, you tend to see more vegetation cover, which then leads to a cooling effect. Um, and, and, and this study actually kind of extended the concept of what's called a luxury effect in urban systems, which is originally used to describe the observed increase in plant diversity associated with higher income areas in Phoenix. Um, the study was able to show that those higher incomes are also associated with the benefits of vegetation in terms of a cooler neighborhood. And then finally, um, we know that urban vegetation can also exert a negative impact on stormwater through pollution. And so this is a study that examined 19 urban watersheds in St. Paul, actually just in my um, kind of backyard. <laughs> the, um, what they've done is they looked at nutrient concentrations in stormwater and found that they were highly variable across these different watersheds in St. Paul, but on the whole, they were strongly correlated to tree canopy over streets. Um, and that's the case, especially for phosphorus, but you can also see this relationship uh, manifested for nitrogen. So this effect of having more tree canopy um, contributing to more nutrients in the stormwater um, across these watersheds were not able to be counterbalanced by their ability to reduce stormwater runoff volumes through interception. So um, when it comes to stormwater interception, the, the increase in nutrient loading from street trees were actually outweighed by their ability to reduce runoff. So this meant that the litter fall from urban trees can actually become a major source of nutrient pollution into lakes. Um, and that kind of contributes to harmful algal blooms during the summer and impair water quality. And because here in Minnesota, um, a lot of us care a lot about our, our lakes. This is the, the state of 10,000 lakes. Um, this has kind of led to other um, policy incentives to, um, to eliminate litter through street sweeping. So overall, um, we see that urban vegetation can increase stormwater infiltration, mitigate the urban heat island effect, um, but they can also become a source of nitrogen and phosphorus export. So the question that our group and, and, and our collaborators are interested in is how do we quantify these feedbacks and trade-offs um, in terms of these, these benefits and, and potential burdens? Um, the reason we want to do that is, is that more data can help inform incentive programs that balance the benefits against the drawbacks. And I'm just here going to list out a few of these types of incentives um, that have been instituted following studies about what trees um, or, or other urban vegetation can do in urban environments. And so following the study on stormwater pollution from a litter, um, kind of municipalities around the metropolitan area in Minneapolis and St. Paul are looking to adapt kind of new um, street sweeping credits for stormwater phosphorus source reduction so that they can meet 
water quality goals that are instituted by the state and other incentives on trees focus um, on the benefit they provide for interception. And so you get uh, about 223 liters of stormwater volume reduced per tree based on the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. And then the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency considers impervious surfaces under trees to be counted as pervious cover. Um, some cases, these numbers are based on really gross estimates of what trees actually do. Um, which makes it even more necessary that we kind of get more quantitative understanding of, of, of what they're doing in an urban environment. We also know that while the impact of trees for mitigating urban heat island effect can be localized at the neighborhood level, their impacts on downstream water quality and quantity are realized at the scale of catchments. And so this means that their spatial configuration uh, within the drainage network becomes an important factor for scaling their stormwater impacts. And so here's another paper that argues that few studies have actually scaled the effect of um, these green infrastructure or low impact development practices from those measured and modeled at the local scales to catchment of multiple scale, uh, spatial scales. Um, uh, which is quite important in complex urbanizing catchments um, that, that drains a variety of land covers. So um, these are, are sort of the overview of the questions that we want to investigate. And we're doing that through um, a new long-term ecological research uh, program established around the Minneapolis and St. Paul metropolitan area, which also studies how urban stressors affect ecological structures and functions of urban nature. Um, including for pollinators, urban forests, urban watersheds, um, lakes and streams. And as part of that project, um, my group, uh, which is looking more closely at urban watershed, we're doing that through um, instrumenting urban trees in the area and trying to scale the effects that we're quantifying at the site level back to that watershed level. And um, I'm just going to highlight uh, in this talk the work that I've been doing in collaboration with Professor Diana Carwin, um, as well as um, my PhD student Sha Ting, who has really spearheaded a lot of the instrumentation development and the modeling work that I'll talk about in this presentation. Um, on the instrumentation side, um, I would say that this is still very much a pro project in early stages. So what I'll be showing you today is just a kind of an early version of the experimental design and the instrumentation deployment. We just finished, um, we're kind of wrapping up our first field season um, this year. And the, the questions we're interested in involve um, things like how does urban trees um, affect the cooling in, in their neighborhoods, how much stormwater runoff can be intercepted by them uh, across seasons, and then how much reduction in, um, in stormwater volumes can coincide with reduction in these nutrient and carbon fluxes. So similar to the paired basin design in um, the Northern Minnesota or Northern Wisconsin study that I showed earlier, um, the city of St. Paul is conducting a structured ash removal program because a lot of our ash trees are infested by the emerald ash borer. Um, and this program is meant to systematically treat or remove ash trees. Um, and you can see in this map that they've already planned it out for the next couple of years. Um, these uh, dots showing the locations of where ash trees are slated to be removed. And so with their support, we're hoping to identify sites where ash trees are, um, are planned to be removed so that we can go in before removal to measure their impact on the surrounding microclimate and stormwater quantity and quality and compare that to what happens after removal. Um, these sites that I'm highlighting here, um, this first season we've put in instruments to four different sites, but most of these sites um, are located in parks or community centers, which them more easily accessible and less constrained by other legal restrictions around installing sensors around the city. 
oh yeah, I also included a picture of us actually putting um, these sensors in, a, in, a, in one of the sites in um, Limwood Park. So at each site, we're interested in measuring things like sap flux uh, to understand the transpiration or how much water is being passed through the trees from the ground into the atmosphere. Um, we're interested in um, air temperature and relative humidity to understand how trees might affect their microclimate and modify uh, or make modifications to the urban heat island effect. Um, we've put uh, rain gauges both in an open area and underneath the canopy to kind of um, see how much uh, through fall gets through the canopy. And then we also have soil moisture sensors to, to see um, how much water they can access underground. Um, in addition to these sensors, we're also collecting samples. Um, so what you see here is a, a throughfall collector for capturing water for chemical analysis. Um, so we can understand um, what kind of chemicals are dry deposited onto the leaf of the trees and, and the, the kind of nutrients that then get washed away through the rain. And so um, the, sta the stable isotope um, uh, analytes that I've listed on the right-hand side can help us potentially infer differences in the sources of those, um, of those nutrients. So we know that through the litter fall, um, a lot of the nutrients retained in litter can get washed away into stormwater, but we don't know where those nutrients come from. And so we're hoping to understand through this isotope analysis, whether they're coming from just natural atmospheric deposition or from you know, uh, traffic, uh, vehicular traffic emissions, or um, just through more um, organic processes that are happening within the trees. So what I have here are showing some, again, preliminary data collected from our first field season. And um, this goes to support that the cooling effect of trees are um, associated with how much water they're taking up as well as other environmental conditions. And so this plot is um, showing the difference well, actually showing how much temperature has been reduced under a canopy from the sensors collected uh, under a tree canopy that are that's in close proximity to another sensor that's placed um, in open air. And so the distance between them are quite close. They're, 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 they're all within the same site, but within that site, there's um, variations in um, you can see kind of this diurnal variation and how much difference can be generated just uh, by having a tree close to where you where the sensor is versus not. Um, and these kind of diurnal patterns in 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 the in the in, in temperature reduction, we think sh should eventually correlate to how much um, water or how much sap flux is being measured through the trees. So how much water of trees are taking up, which is shown in this kind of gray bar area here. You'll notice in this particular site of Limwood, there's a midday dip. Um, we are still looking into why that is happening. Uh, we think it might be related to the fact that trees tend to shut their stonemates when things get really hot and, and really dry in the middle of the day. This is something that we see in natural systems, but I'm still really not sure at this point why we're only seeing this in one site and not the other sites. So that's yet to be something um, that we need to investigate. Um, but because we're collecting these type of information along with a slew of other environmental sensors, um, we can see that this tree water use or transpiration is controlled by both what's happening on the atmospheric side in terms of vapor pressure deficit. So vapor pressure deficit is, is a metric of atmospheric water demand that's a function of temperature and relative humidity, as well as soil water supply. And so these two um, snapshots are highlighting what, um, what's going on in terms of sap flux in black 
as they change diurnally in response to changes in vapor pressure deficit. Again, this atmospheric water demand, that's a function of temperature and relative hum humidity um, on days that don't encounter rain. But on days where, um, where it would have rained, um, which is shown in these blue bars, you can see that transpiration can actually spike up quite a lot despite not having had a lot of atmospheric water demand because um, I think uh, because these trees have been relatively drought stressed. So Minnesota is in the kind of southern part of the state encountering one of the 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 the, the more intense drought periods right now. Um, in Minnesota standards. Um, and a lot of these trees haven't had water in many days. And so as soon as the, the rainfall comes, they kind of uh, spike up their water use. And then this is um, emerging despite the fact that vapor pressure deficit is not very high. And so we're still hoping to understand these behaviors, but eventually what we want to do is to, um, to use these measurements and pair them with stormwater measurements taken at the um, watershed level by the Capital Region Watershed District um, within the sub watersheds in which the sites are located. And so these um, kind of pale background that you see here behind um, in the background of this map is showing sub catchments in the Capital Region watershed district and at each of these outlets shown in blue, we're measuring, we're getting information from the, the, the stormwater managers there in terms of things like total phosphorus and the base flow, um, uh, as well as other nutrients and stormwater volumes. So that connection between site level and catchment level responses is really something that we're hoping to um, established through the modeling work that I'll talk about next. So I'll just kind of summarize um, our efforts here. Uh, again, acknowledging that this is something that we're just beginning to um, process. We're showing some preliminary evidence um, for the fact that the cooling effects of trees are controlled by transpiration or tree water use, along with other ambient um, conditions like temperature and vapor pressure deficit. Um, we're hoping to eventually show that the trees will reduce stormwater runoff in correlation with leaf area in the canopy, um, saturating at high rainfall intensity. This is one of our hypotheses. Um, and then another hypothesis is, is how they will transition between nutrient sources and sinks depending on the environmental conditions as well as their phenological characteristics. All right, so then um, kind of moving on to the model-based part of, of, of the scaling effort, what we're interested in here is, um, is kind of developing a framework for extending our site level findings to watershed level impacts on stormwater. And so the first question, for us um, is related to storm, uh, stormwater network design. So on a watershed scale, how does green infrastructure change the travel time in a stormwater network? And the second question is related to how these um, design parameters will be um, upheld under different rainfall scenarios, under climate change, where should we plan for green infrastructure when we expect more intense and more frequent rainfall? The tools that we're using for this scaling approach is first the um, Environmental Protection Agency's stormwater management model called SWIM. Um, SWIM is operationally used for design and sizing of drainage system components for flood and water quality control. Um, it adopts principles of fluid mechanics, open channel flow, pressure propagated flow, and so a lot of the physics is already coded into this model that we don't have to re reconstruct ourselves. Um, and in addition to SWIM, we're also hoping to adopt a more flexible approach to exploring the effect of spatial configuration and hydrological connectivity. Um, for that, we're trying to use graph theory, which would represent inlets to the stormwater system 
um, as nodes and the hydrologic connections between them as links. So these the, the pipes between the stormwater nodes. So this will allow us to explore um, graphs that have similar mathematical properties, but different layouts so that our results will not be um, kind of constrained by the specific geographical uh, uh, features in any particular location. And so what I'm showing here are just two types of graphs with very similar network properties, but they have different layouts. Um, the way we're going to try to tackle this is through a, um, by first setting up these graph-based stormwater networks. And here we're focusing on lattice graphs because it's mapped onto a two-dimensional plane, um, very similar to how our stormwater infrastructure networks is, is also kind of mapped out like two-dimensionally. And what I'm showing here is just a two uniform spanning trees on a five by five square lattice graph with different flow path and a single outlet. We're gonna feed these um, network kind of synthetic network designs into SWIM under a range of rainfall scenarios, and then analyze the resulting stormwater outcomes in terms of uh, peak flow at the outlet, and then the total flood volume in those inland nodes. The particular parameter that we're focusing on in the setup of these synthetic stormwater networks will be what we call network path difference, or like we kind of short, shorthanded it using H, which is the flow path difference in a given network between the actual flow path from one point to the outlet and then the shortest distance from that point to the outlet. And what we're trying to do is to differentiate the level of meandering that can be observed in a stormwater network. And so in this left-hand side, uh, as an example for a low H shorter flow path case, we might have uh, a water droplet arriving at a particular point, but the path it takes to the outlet follows the shortest path possible. On the right-hand side, when you have kind of a, a sprawling, more meandering network, you might have a water droplet that arrives at that particular point. In terms of geographical distance, it's not very far from the outlet, but it might take a longer travel path to get to that outlet. And so that's what we're hoping to distinguish using this particular parameter. And to uh, constrain these synthetic networks to reasonable values of that parameter, we're taking shape files of real stormwater networks and fitting them onto lattice graphs, like this example that you're seeing on the left-hand side. So we're, we're currently working to decompose the evolution of, of some of these real stormwater networks, like this one found in, um, in the suburbs of, uh, of Woodbury, calculating their corresponding H parameter and kind of assigning reasonable range of this parameter from which we'll uh, simulate our networks. Um, the way we do that, uh, or develop the way we develop different versions of this network with similar network properties, um, is 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 through a Monte Carlo simulation approach that defines the transition probabilities between alternate networks based on their path differences. And so you can see here that we're able to generate something that's um, that that has a lower H versus a higher H on the right hand side. Um, onto the same uh, geographical footprint. These are both five by five lattice graph. They cover similar area, but their underlying structure looks very different. And again, this is to attribute the results to actual network structure rather than the specifics of a particular network layout that you might find in this city versus that city. So some of the other parameters that we're interested in investigating through this workflow is um, things like the percentage of coverage of green infrastructure. And so on, the, on, on this side, you're seeing that of the 100 nodes that we have in a 10 by 10 graph, about 10% of it is denoted by uh, green infrastructure. And these um, are what we're gonna use in, um, what we're gonna do in SWIM is to represent these using a particular green infrastructure module. Um, and that will 
change the storage capacity of these nodes compared to other nodes that don't have these green infrastructure. Um, along with uh, the proximity of these nodes to the outlet. And so here um, we're moving, oops, jumping ahead. Here we're moving those nodes closer to where the outlet is. So the proximity will be a, a lower value. And then here, the, those same percentage of nodes is moved farther away from the outlet. So by kind of changing those design parameters, feeding the resulting networks into SWIM, and then analyzing their out, uh, outcomes, we're able to produce results like this. And so on this graph, I'm showing the peak flow rate at the outlet and the total flood volume within each of those nodes inland of those, um, of those graphs against um, something like the percentage of green infrastructure nodes that are covering the, um, the graph uh, for different levels of rainfall intensity from two-year rainfall, which is um, something that you might, we might encounter more frequently to a hundred year rainfall intensities is something that we might encounter um, uh, in a more extreme case under climate change. And so this result actually is, is, is actually not un unexpected because it says with a greater percentage of nodes that are covered by green infrastructure, you can observe reductions in both the peak flow rates at the outlet as well as the total flood volume. So the more nuanced result here is the fact that green infrastructure coverage is more effective for different outcomes at different intensities. And so the effectiveness of green infrastructure um, depends on the outcome of interest. And so if you're interested in reducing peak flow rate at the outlet, it works better for um, rainfall at lower intensities um, than if you're in, compared to when, when you're interested in reducing the total flood volume, green infrastructure is gonna be more effective for that at higher rainfall intensities. So in terms of peak flow reduction at the outlet, we can actually see the effect of green infrastructure saturating at higher rainfall intensities. Um, a second result I'm showing here is kind of plotted in the same way, but against the proximity of the green infrastructure nodes to the outlet. And so we're showing that this, um, these green infrastructure is actually also controlled by the location within the stormwater pipe network. And so at rainfall intensities that are lower, if you put them closer to the outlet, it will generate a greater effect on peak flow rates at the outlet. And so um, in these other scenarios, it didn't really matter where you put the, them because either the effect saturated or they're not really that, um, uh, the effect of, uh, Proximity to the outlet didn't really matter when, when we were considering the, the total flood volume within the, within the network. Um, and what I'm showing here in these results is also a difference in, in the network structure for a network that has low meandering in the darker colors and high meandering in the lighter colors, uh, which for this purpose didn't quite make much of a difference. But for our third result, um, actually generated that was something generated some results that were um, quite interesting for us. And so what I'm showing here now is the peak flow rate again at the outlet and the total flood volume now for a fixed number of green infrastructure nodes, but on networks that have different path differences. And so they have different structure with the H representing more of a meandering network. Um, and so here, when we fix the network pipes to um, a given diameter, so they're all of the, all the same diameter, the more meandering the networks are, um, or higher the H is, it produces more divergent results in terms of peak flow versus, um, versus total flood volume. So this means that with pipes of fixed diameter, increasing H increase the travel distance and the time 
that uh, water takes in order to get to the outlet, which spread out the hydrograph and reduced the peak flow at the downstream outlet. But this outcome is achieved at the expense of potentially higher inland flooding within the network, again, due to the increase in the amount of time water spends inside the network due to increase in meander created by H. And of course, you see this trade-off is quite consistent across a range of rainfall intensities. Um, but what was surprising to us is that when we sized the pipes to design storms, um, which meant that the, the, the diameter of those pipes changed as you get closer and closer to the, um, the outlet, the, um, the volume of inland flooding is reduced compared to when these pipe sizes are fixed. And so that's comparing the darker colors to the lighter colors. But the peak flow rate actually increased as you increase the meander. So this, this was a surprising result because this, this kind of generates the question of why we would want to build more storm appropriate size, sized pipes if they were going to increase peak flow at the outlet, uh, which led us to some digging <laughs> into the model results that helped us realize is that this is um, this, this increased peak flow at the outlet is also a function of how much we have increased the carrying capacity of the overall system um, or the storage of the system by increasing the way that the pipes meander. So by increasing the storage, the pipes are now able to convey a larger volume of water to the outlet more quickly and thus increasing the peak flow. Um, so I, I think it's it, it's somewhat of a confusing set of variables to try to all um, quantify together. Um, and what we're doing now is is to trying to develop a more conceptual understanding of what happens to, to the peak flow rate as a function of the total amount of water stored in the system, as well as the transport efficiency. How quickly can those pipes convey the water to the outlet? Both of those things are gonna be affected by the way that the network structure meanders um, and by kind of normalizing the effect of one against the other, we think that this might make it possible to achieve some minimum in the peak flow rate generation um, as a function of both of these uh, uh, controlling variables. All right, so I'll, I'll just kind of wrap this up by saying that uh, at the catchment level, by using this model-based approach to, to understanding stormwater um, outcomes, uh, we know that the effectiveness of green infrastructure on stormwater is modulated by stormwater structure, which determines this balance and trade-off between transport efficiency in the hydrological watershed system versus the overall storage capacity of that system. Uh, that the effectiveness also depends on whether you're interested in reducing peak flow or if you're interested in reducing overall flooding within the nodes. And that it is um, context dependent. And so at higher rainfall intensities, the effectiveness of these green infrastructure actually saturates. So we have to kind of consider what happens um, uh, under climate change scenarios um, in a more integrative way that combines the use of both green infrastructure and uh, gray infrastructure, so the, the, the pipes. Um, ultimately, we wanna to work towards uh, managing these urban trees and urban green infrastructure towards these multiple benefits at different spatial scales so that impacts can be quantified at the appropriate scale. Um, I'll just wrap up this presentation by, by saying that, um, you know, as we're thinking through this coordination of vegetation at the catchment level, um, we should also keep in mind this larger social economic context in which the spatial patterns of urban vegetations are found. And so study after study have shown significant correlations between tree cover. And this is, um, I'm just using an example from Minneapolis since that's, that's where I'm most familiar with. 
the significant correlations between tree cover and the associated benefits offered by tree cover, like cooling and stormwater reduction, to um, social economic variables like income level and race. So um, now there's a lot of work being done to try to link these observed patterns to historical legacies of policy and law, um, such as redlining and racial covenants. And ultimately, I think for, um, for us engineers and city, city planners, we, we don't really make those decisions about green infrastructure in a bubble, right? So um, I'm showing here two examples of capital investments made by the Mississippi Watershed Management Organization, um, neither of which are, are very far from where I live. One is an affordable housing complex with stormwater management features in a historically underserved area in the city. And then the other is a habitat restoration and housing project um, in a gentrifying neighborhood. So if we're going to use urban nature to, to try to improve the quality of life for urban residents, we have to think about who our decisions might benefit and what kind of trade-offs might exist for people who live both in the vicinity of those projects and those who might shoulder the burden at a different scale. And so I think we all have a an obligation to, to, to kind of pose our engineering design objectives within that larger historical, social, and um, economic context so that we can share the benefits of a green city. So I'll, I'll just um, wrap it up here and thank everybody for your attention. Um, I'm happy to follow up with uh, any email inquiries or questions. Thanks. All right. Thanks so much, Shay. That was that was really engaging, actually, and and quite interesting to see some of the feedbacks coming out of that modeling and how unexpected they were. Um, you know, with what what potentially one might think going into that. So thank you for that. Um, we'll stop the recording now and try to sort of moderate questions here. Um, we can go back and forth.